I'm waiting for everyone to get a seat. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us. It's an uncharacteristically cold evening for Southern California, but I hope that, you know, with all this discussion, the atmosphere is going to become much, much warmer here. My name is Anastasia Lucaitu Sideris. I'm the interim dean of the UCLA Laskin School of Public Affairs. And on behalf of our school's faculty and staff and students, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this UCLA Laskin Lecture. Tonight's presentation, like UCLA School of Public Affairs itself, is named for Mayor Enrini Laskin, whose generosity and vision have made much of what we do possible. But before I continue, I wish to recognize that as a land grant institution, we at UCLA acknowledge and honor the sacrifice of the Gabrielino Tokva peoples as they were the traditional land caretakers of Tovankar, the land upon which our campus now stands. With the last King Lecture Series, we bring to UCLA brilliant scholars for discussions of some of society's most pressing issues and problems. And this is certainly the case in today's lecture. The last King Lecture Series is just one example of what makes UCLA such an amazing place, one of the smartest places on Earth. The university is regarded as the nation's finest public research institution, ranked for five years in a row by the US News and World Reports as the best public university in the US. Within this great university, the Laskin School of Public Affairs holds a special place. In my 34 years as a professor and now as interim dean, I have witnessed the development and evolution of our school into the very great place it is today a place that fosters interdisciplinary knowledge, that brings together scholars from different disciplines, that educates students to become successful professionals and academics in urban planning, social welfare, and public policy. And the common thread in all this is social justice and a desire to make cities and society better. Almost every student that comes through our doors is here because they he or she or they want to improve things. By uniting our individual disciplines and finding common purpose, we are able to tackle complex issues comprehensively and find, seek and find innovative policy solutions. And here are a few facts about the Laskin School that maybe make me feel particularly proud. We added 32 new Senate faculty in the last five years. We now employ more than 100 full-time faculty, staff researchers, and lecturers, and educate over 1,100 undergraduate, professional degree, and doctoral students. 50% of our faculty are women, and 50% of our faculty are people of color. Our student body is the most diverse in the University of California system. Over 35% of our students are first-generation college students. Our faculty are extraordinarily productive. Last year, we won over 20 million in extramural research grants and contracts. We are on pace to exceed this amount this year. At UCLA Laskin, our disciplines are distinct, but our mission is remarkably intertwined. Our faculty engage in path-breaking research that affects lives and communities here in Los Angeles, in California, in the nation, and around the globe. We believe in evidence-based policy making and research-informed practice. Of course, we have nationally and internationally prominent faculty members in transportation, but also in housing, community development, urban design, regional development, environmental policy, health policy, education policy. They study environmental degradation and climate change, gentrification and displacement, inequality, health disparities, to name just a few topics. We have leading researchers in suicide, aging, the criminal injustice system, education policy, women and women's rights, civil society institutions, child welfare, and immigration policy. Again, to just name a few. Our laboratory is California, a state known for its innovation and its entrepreneurial spirit. 
And we have the good fortune to do our work in Los Angeles, the second largest city in the United States, a global city, home to many of the largest communities of immigrants from around the world, immigrants with strange names, such as Lucaitu Sideris. <laughs> this is a place where ideas are formed, change is nurtured, and solutions are tested and perfected. Tonight, we are honored to be joined by a speaker whose ideas make him a leader in sustainable transportation policy and planning, and we're even more proud that he's a UCLA alumnus, an urban planning alumnus, Robert Cervero. Welcome back to campus, Robert. During his doctor <laughs> During his doctoral studies in urban planning at UCLA, Robert Cervero worked under the supervision of a very dear colleague, a very dear mentor, and a very dear friend, the late Martin Wax. And we have the Wax family with us, and we thank you very much for being this. In Marty's memory, this lecture will be given today. Like tonight's speaker, Professor Wax had a very deep and lasting impact at UCLA and at UC Berkeley, but also on the whole field of transportation planning. At this point, it's my pleasure to turn the program over to my friend and colleague, Professor Brian Taylor, director of the Institute, or, well, on sabbatical director of the Institute of, <laughs> sorry, Transportation Studies. Professor Adam miller Board is our director of ITS, but Brian has been directing it for so many years, so it comes natural. <laughs> ITS is the co-sponsor of tonight's event, and Brian will tell you more about tonight's speaker. We are all very excited to hear what Professor Cervero has to say about the important topics of transportation, accessibility, and social equity. So please help me welcome Brian Taylor. Thank you, Anastasia. Um, good evening and welcome. Uh, I am, as you, you heard, Brian Taylor. And I, the, the title I was sharing is Professor of Urban Planning and Public Policy at UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs. I am indeed on sabbatical this, uh, this year. <laughs> it's my honor to welcome you to the 15th annual Martin Wax Distinguished Lecture in Transportation to be delivered this evening by Professor Emeritus Robert Severo of the University of California, Berkeley. Now this evening's lecture, as you heard, is part of the prestigious lecture, Luskin Lecture Series and is co-hosted this evening by the UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs and the UCLA Institute of Transportation Studies. Tonight's lecture honors the foresight of Meyer and Rainey Luskin, whose extraordinary generosity supports not only this lecture series and the Luskin School, but many other UCLA faculty, uh, facilities, programs, and initiatives. And it's with more than a touch of sadness, as Anastasia also noted, that, that uh, this is the first uh, memorial lecture in the WAX uh, series. As Professor Emeritus Wax attended each of the first 14 lectures in the series prior to his passing in the spring of 2001. Professor Wax, for those of you who may not have known him, spent 25 years on the UCLA urban planning faculty between 1971 and 1996, serving three terms as head of the urban planning program. In addition to his prominent and productive uh, scholarship of transportation policy and planning over a half century, Professor Wax mentored many hundreds of master students studying transportation who now work in virtually every corner of our profession. He also advised many dozens of doctoral students, including most notably tonight's speaker, Robert Severo. In 1996, Professor Wax moved north to UC Berkeley for a decade to head the University of California Transportation Center and then the UC Berkeley Institute of Transportation Studies, where he was a colleague of Professor Severo's. While Professor Wax is not with us this evening, his wife Helen, uh, uh, daughter uh, Faye, and son-in-law Navid, uh, son Steve, and daughter-in-law Shirley are all here in attendance this evening. And this is an indeed a special occasion for the Wax family, as today is Helen's birthday as well. Happy birthday, Helen. I was going to have us all sing, but I thought I wouldn't put her through that. And now to tonight's speaker. Uh, Robert Severo is arguably the preeminent transportation planning scholar of his generation. He is best known for his pioneering research on the nexus between urban transportation and land use systems. And while the idea 
that land use and transportation systems cannot be planned or operated in isolation from one another is now commonplace in professional practice. It was not when Professor Severo began his career in the late 1970s. Indeed, much of the shift in this thinking over the past four decades is due to the work of Professor Severo. One measure of uh, Professor Severo's influence on transportation planning is that he's among the most cited scholars in the entire field of planning. His publications have been cited over 52,000 times, according to Google Scholar, and eight of his works have been cited over 1,000 times each. Many of these pieces, such as Travel Demand and the Three Ds, Density, Diversity, and Design, are widely acknowledged classics in the field. In addition to his hundreds of research articles and reports, Professor Severa has authored or co-authored 10 books. I would also notice that, uh, note that Professor Severo's scholarship is notable for its geographic diversity. He has long been interested in what cities and countries around the world can learn from one another, and as a result, his research has long been distinguished by its lack of parochialism. In addition to the numerous awards and honors for his scholarship and a raft of international visiting uh, scholar positions, Professor Severo is also an accomplished teacher and was an academic leader as well. I can personally attest to his meticulous preparation and effectiveness as a teacher. He was twice ch uh, chair of the UC Berkeley uh, Department of City and Regional Planning, and he directed the UC, uh, um, uh, the University of California uh, Transportation Center, as well as the UC Berkeley Institute on Urban and Regional Development. When he formally retired in 2016, Professor Severo held the Carmel P. Friesen Distinguished Chair in Urban Studies. With this overview of tonight's speaker, it's my honor to welcome urban planning, UCLA Urban Planning PhD alumnus, Robert Severo back to Westwood to present the Luskin Lecture and Martin Wax Distinguished Lecture entitled Accessibility, Social Equity, and Contemporary Policy Debates. Professor Severo. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Well, uh, thank you so much for that warm, kind, amazing introduction. I. Uh, started reflecting on this. Did I actually have 52,000 people cite my work? So anyway, I'm delighted to hear that. I wasn't aware of that. Uh, the first thing I, I want to say is happy birthday, Helen. Uh, wow, what a, what a wonderful surprise to hear that. So, uh, so, so it's an absolute delight to revisit Westwood. Uh, I, I wish the weather was a little more cooperative, and a little warmer, but you know, I, I've lived in California long enough to know where we're going to face about eight months of bone dry, arid weather, so let's not bicker. So anyway, thank you for coming, uh, notwithstanding somewhat the blustery weather. And, and thank you for the kind invitation to be here. It's an absolute honor and privilege to be here and to, uh, to give this talk. So um, my, my pleasure. Um, I, I, one of the cardinal rules of public speaking is to never start off with an apology. And I'm gonna break that rule by doing that very thing uh, in the sense that when Brian contacted me about giving this lecture, I said, well, I, I'm honored, Brian. I'd absolutely love to give a talk in honor of my mentor, Martin Wax. But I said, you know, the reality is I've been retired for seven years and I've had done absolutely no research since then. I don't have anything new to say. Every, you know, I, 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 I can come and repeat stuff I did 10 or 20 or 30 years ago, but nobody wants to hear an old academic drone on and on about work they did in the past. I said the best I might be able to do is reflect and revisit some of my past research and try to connect it uh, to some of the contemporary policy issues. And Brian, of course, being the cheery gentleman he is, so if you're sure, do that, do that, that's fine. <laughs> so anyway, that, that's why I'm here. But it, it actually dawned on me that, um, a really important foundational piece of work that was published one half century ago, 50 years ago, was Marty Wax's paper on accessibility. And why don't I wrap my talk, since I have nothing necessarily new to say, um, around the theme of that paper and try to um, show how it really shaped my own research uh, in this field and maybe, and I would suggest generations of other people as well. So, um, so, so, um, okay, so yeah, um, as I noted, uh, probably the, one of the most impactful pieces of work that influenced my thinking about the field of transportation and urbanism and how we design cities and how it affects travel behavior and so forth 
is this wonderful piece that Marty uh, co-wrote with Gordon Kumagai, uh, who I think was a graduate student at the time of Marty's, and to Marty's credit, you know, he included his student in the authorship of this article, something I learned very quickly, you should do as a professor. Uh, but it, it, the title was uh, Physical Accessibility as a Social Indicator, and I emphasize the word social. Um, and, and the article really um, highlights a number of different contexts of which accessibility should really be an overarching principle that guides what we do in this field of urban planning and transportation more specifically, in, in defining it as a important component of a social report, how we really look at the social well-being of our cities and regions. Um, I uh, have to confess, when I arrived at UCLA in, in 1977, I had very little exposure to this idea of social justice and social equity. I came out of an engineering program at Georgia Tech um, I, um, where social equity was never discussed. Um, I had just arrived from Billings, Montana, of all places, as a transportation planner. B Billings by the way, just got the notoriety as the place where they first spotted the Chinese balloon that was floating up there. <laughs> Weather balloon, surveillance balloon, whatever. Anyway, uh, and, and at the time, I uh, had been um, sort of fighting the Montana Highway Department, and I emphasized the word highway. It was not a Department of Transportation. They were in the business of building highways all over the, uh, the state. Uh, so this idea of social equity was brand new to me, and Marty in many ways sensitized me to this. But in this article, Marty made the point with his co-author that you know accessibility happens at multiple scales. It's uh, you know regional access to jobs or medical facilities, uh, but also at a micro scale. Do you have access to say a bus? So uh, he brought this kind of rich nature of accessibility at multiple scales, but also linked it to not only the physical composition and makeup of our cities and regions, where land use activities are and so forth, but also this notion of a socioeconomic status. Uh, what I, uh, I, in a lot of my work, um, refer to as sort of a social um, matching, socioeconomic matching, and I'll sort of get into that briefly in some of my, my research. Um, but, you know, he, he sort of in this article makes the point, you might have access to a lot of jobs. But unless you have the skill set to, to qualify for those jobs, you don't have good job accessibility. Or you might live near a lot of bus stops and, and bus routes. But at the time, this was pre-ADA, if you're in a wheelchair and the buses don't have wheelchair lifts, you don't have great transit access. So nobody at the time sort of brought these very important socioeconomic, almost humanist components and how we think about, engage, and measure access. To me, it was truly revolutionary. It had, a, as I said, a profound foundational effect on my research. As I noted, Marty also sensitized me to this uh, idea of social equity. When I arrived at UCLA, and weren't we a, a good-looking uh, pair at the time? <laughs> I, I look at that and say, if only I had that youth again. Anyway, that aside. Uh, well, you know, Marty brought, exposed me, you know, he really encouraged me to do my dissertation on this idea of, of, of finding a fair affair. And at the time, you know, still, um, we, in this research project, we studied how we price public transit. And of course, we still largely have what are called flat fare systems. But we did a fairly careful cost analysis of the cost of off-peak versus peak services, long distance versus short distances, uh, serv uh, short uh, distance um, services. And if you look at this very carefully, you find that there's a lot of cross subsidies going on. Inner city, lower income, often minority households that are making more off-peak trips and shorter distance trips are paying a lot more relative to the cost of their services than affluent suburbanites going longer distances, mainly in the peak when the services are, the marginal costs are very high of public transit. So, you know, this whole idea of social justice and equity and pricing and transportation was, was again new to me. So it, 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 he not only enlightened me about the importance of equity, uh, I'm sorry, accessibility, but this also core notion of, of, of equity. 
So I, you know, it just honored me. In honor of Marty's wonderful publication of 50 years ago, it's sensible that I kind of link that research to my own research, how it shaped foundationally my own thinking and in sort of research analysis and try to tie it to some of these contemporary policy debates. Anyway, this is a list of what I had prepared to talk about, these research topics and how Marty's work and shaped my own analyses of, of access and its outcome effects. Uh, this was the presentation when I was told I had 50 minutes to give the talk. I got an, um, an outline a couple weeks ago saying I only have 20 minutes, so I'm not going to cover all this. Th this I, I'm going to give a very abbreviated version of this. I'm going to talk about, very briefly, jobs, housing, balance, and link it to the 15-minute city and a little bit about spatial mismatch, welfare to work, uh, because these are all studies where I used Marty's thinking and early work on access and uh, the social economic qualifier metric to do the analysis. But I put this up here, we, um, Adam and I are gonna have some time up here in case any of you care to get on some of these other topics, transit-oriented development, TOD, or I've done a lot of more recent work on, on the Global South, um, my original talk covered that, so anyway, I, I put this up here. Um, let, so let me just, again, in light of time, just touch on a few of these things. Um, jobs, housing, balance particularly. I, I did a fair amount of research uh, in the 80s and 90s. These are articles that came out in the Journal of the American Planning Association. At the time, um, jobs, housing, balance w was a really important, uh, well-debated issue because we, we were experiencing suburban traffic congestion unlike um, had happened prior to that. And, and a lot of the hypothesis was it was a spatial mismatch between where people lived and where they worked, and that things were, were getting worse over time. So anyway, in these articles, I uh, did research on the effects of post Proposition 13, finding that there were a lot of communities that fiscally zoned and zoned ex uh, exclusionary policy, keeping out working class residents from the inner city area and displacing them to far flung suburbs. And this was setting the stage for long distance commutes and all the environmental problems. Uh, and a piece that I, uh, w one of the controversies of this line of work, by the way, um, a, a lot of people said, okay, well, this might be a problem, but the market will correct this what's called co-location. That is, if you don't have enough housing, um, then developers are going to come in and build sufficient housing for the workforce. And then employers are going to look where there's available workers and locate their office plants there. That was the logic. So um, I did another study trying to show um, whether co-location was happening. And in this second study, yeah, it was happening to some degree, but it wasn't happening in the job-rich, job-surplus places particularly places like uh, these studies were done in the San Francisco Bay Area, like Palo Alto or Sunnyvale, these very well-to-do, high-tech exclusive communities just simply weren't building enough affordable housing. So I tried to link this to um, the, the problems of, of commuting and, and sustainability and environmental problems that were being faced. And, and I do know, by the way, uh, Evie Blumenberg, and uh, I met her today, Hannah King, uh, did an update of this work showing that this co-location theory wasn't holding that actually places over time in the Bay Area that she revisited the same places I looked at in the 90s uh, were becoming more imbalanced and, and uh, having uh, potentially some more of the, the commuting problems. Um, but what I wanted to talk about, particularly on this jobs housing balance theme, was this, per this study here that I did that, again, I borrowed largely from Marty Wax's uh, and early writings on this, where we compared the sustainability benefits of balancing jobs and housing versus uh, mixing retail. And um, without getting into a lot of detail, took data from the San Francisco Bay Area. I, I'm an unabashed empiricist in the sense of most of my research uh, used data from the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and uh, in this study, I used this idea of accessibility index. This is, if you're in the transportation field, you might recognize this as a isochronic kind of map. But in here, I, I, I looked at the number of jobs that residents of each of these locations could reach which, within their occupational category, occupational matching. Again, this core metric that Marty introduced in his early writing 
that could be reached within four miles. So the bright red dots in San Francisco, for instance, means that people in different fields, uh, professional fields, service, blue collar jobs, could on average reach 31,000 jobs within four miles on both the roadway and the transit network. The light colors were less than 8,000, so there was a lot of disparity in occupational match job access. Um, did the same thing on retail service access. Uh, we, you know, in, in this field, we actually look at retail service jobs as a metric of retail activities, and the same thing, uh, denser transit-served neighborhoods had more retail service activities they could reach in uh, four miles. And we did this, by the way, over a whole range of, of isochrons, up to 12 miles, 15 miles, but anyway, four miles kind of statistically worked the best. And in this article, again, um, my presentation here is kind of revisiting some of my past work, but using this wax kind of informed um, Quality, social uh, economic qualitative matching metric of, of job access, uh, we showed the relationship between job access and vehicle miles traveled for commute trips was fairly robust. Uh, by the way, in the, in the transportation field, we track VMT, vehicle miles traveled per capita typically, because it's probably the best metric to reflect sustainability in the transport sector. is VMT per person goes up, so do tailpipe emissions, so do carbon emissions, so does land consumption. So it's kind of a negative that we try to, for the most part, modulate. And the relationship we found here was a doubling of job access in your occupation area that you qualify, all things else being equal, controlled for a lot of other things under models there was a 34% reduction in commute VMT. So a fairly strong statistical relationship we came up with. Um, using the retail access study, um, there was a, a, a relationship, but it wasn't as strong. If you doubled the number of, of retail activities you could reach within four miles, there was a 17% roughly reduction in VMT for shop trips. So, and if you count for the fact that a lot more VMT goes for commuting than it does go for shopping, <clears throat> the conclusion of the study is you're gonna have three to four times the impact on VMT reduction in a region, three to four times as much effect in potentially reducing carbon and, and other types of tail life emissions and so forth through jobs housing balance as you would by intermixing, say, retail activities. That was more or less the conclusion of this work. Well, I built my talk as sort of reflecting how this past work, informed by Marty's thinking and early metrics, might shape some contemporary policy debate. So the policy debate here is this accessible city, the 15-minute city. Um, some of you might be aware of Paris, particularly Mayor Hidalgo gets a lot of credit for flo first floating this idea. We should be designing cities not for just moving about. You know, move, movement is secondary. We're not hopping in cars or trains and buses just to move. We're going to places, and that, that's really what matters. And we should design communities so we shrink the distance to the 15-minute city. So kind of everyday activities are within 15 minutes. Uh, but the controversial is that uh, part of this is that northeast quadrant, that green which shows work. And this has really brought a lot of harsh criticism. <clears throat> Should this idea of a 15-minute balanced city hold for everything? And there's been a lot of negative criticism, particularly from urban economists. People like uh, Ed Glazer from Harvard and elsewhere have been quite critical, and, and somewhat rightfully so, that if you really insist on this, you potentially stifle economic competition and firm choice. You know, companies don't want to thinly distribute activities everywhere so people are within a 15 minute distance of the job site. Um, they congregate, they cluster. I mean, the reasons we have downtowns, what economists call agglomeration economies, is the benefits, the economic benefits, the knowledge spillover, the creativity, the discovery that comes from highly skilled, knowledgeable people being very close to you, bouncing ideas off, day-to-day, face-to-face engagement. And you don't do that by distributing things. Or if you buy 
a car or um, a couch. You know, you don't do that every week. You do it occasionally. You want to do comparative shopping, so you have clustering of those activities. So this idea of the 15-minute city really runs in the face of what economists have long argued are important economic drivers towards um, uh, the economic growth and performance of a city. So. Um, by the way, I just wanted to pull out another piece of work that I found fascinating. A friend of mine, Elaine Bertard, who's formerly with the World Bank, is now in the urban planning program at NYU. Um, he, he's a staunch critic of this idea of the 15-minute city. If you read his writing, and this comes from an, a piece he did last year called The Last Utopia, when he, he took um, most non-work activities in his hometown of Paris, these happen to be uh, bakeries, boulangerie, uh, if you take a 15-minute circle around any residence, given an assumed walking speed of four and a half kilometers per hour, and given the grid lay, layout of streets and fairly dense um, kind of pre-automobile grid streeted cities like Paris, um, you know, typically you don't need market interventions. You already have that. The, you know, the typical neighborhood has 55 to 60 boulons raised within 15 minutes. <laughs> We should all be so privileged. I, I mean, I, I, I would have to drive 45 minutes to find a decent boulangerie where I live. Anyway, that aside. Um, uh, so yeah, you, you don't need it. The, the market's already prevented. But on the other hand, um, most, even though the average Parisian has 65,000 jobs within 15 minutes, the typical commute of a Parisian worker, only 12% are within 15 minutes. So clearly, they're getting employment not tied to this idea of, of close, easy access. It's wherever um, you're going to find the right job and so forth. And this, I wanted to, you know, again, reflecting on my past work, uh, reflect a little. I did some research that, again, somewhat drawing from Marty's work that. Um, and I'm sorry for this kind of messy looking econometric stuff here, but I did this article in Urban Studies in 2001 called Economic Performance in the Shape of the Metropolis. And I really went in with a study assuming that I would find density and transit service would be a very strong predictor of labor productivity changes between 1990 and 2000 in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and you know what I found is, and you know, sorry for this, this kind of numbers, but yeah, you increase transit service access, and uh, you um, increase e uh, employment density, which leads to higher labor productivity. But the larger effect was, I found in San Francisco, and I actually did similar studies across 46 metropolitan areas, that the speed of the freeway network led to more spread out access, which enlarged labor sheds, which allowed better matching. And what, what was happening here was matching of the employer had more, with a larger expanded la labor shed, that is more sprawl, so to speak, had more number of potential workers to match up with the job. They could get the right worker for the right job, and the same thing, employees could find the right job given their skill sets and, and employment aspirations. So this was an analysis driven by studies of access, which linked uh, labor productivity and economic performance, but um, more finding that on the side of the critics of the 15-minute city, when it comes to jobs, uh, having less concentration, more spread out development, and higher performing freeways were more uh, better uh, connected to labor productivity. So anyway, uh, so my, my, my link here would, would be this. You know, I, I think the idea of accessible, the accessible city, of course, is great. I mean, we, we not, want this not only to allow people to reduce DMT and walk to places, but we want to have active living, you know, environments where people on a daily basis just get out and walk and bike. And you know, we have a, a continuing obesity epidemic uh, worldwide. And we also want to build social capital. We want people from all walks of life to come in regular day-to-day -day contact and begin to gain some empathy and understanding for people less well-off, perhaps. There's a lot of other reasons we should be encouraging 
um, walking and access within this kind of sensible 15 minute travel shed. It, but we don't necessarily want it for everything. We don't want it for work and other activities. And I think all the research kind of shows that the point. So I happen to be doing a lot of work in Shanghai and I interacted with a lot of planners. I like this idea of their 15 minute community life circle where things like uh, food markets, of course you want to be able to have fresh fruits and vegetables within five to 10 minutes. And, and there's no reason we shouldn't design our cities for that. And you want to have middle schools within 10 minutes and you want to say have a community medical facility uh, within 15 minutes, but you don't necessarily need everyone to have a specialist regional hospital within 15 minutes, nor do you need access to a sports stadium in 15 minutes. There's certain things you don't include and things you do, and a little more articulation of this idea of this accessible city. And of course, employment's not there. And I've been working in Singapore as well. I've been part of a, a, an advisory committee uh, going there annually, and, and they've come up with this idea of the 20-minute town and 45-minute city. The same thing. Design Singapore so by foot, bike, electric scooter, or transit, um, you can reach a lot of things within 20 minutes. But it, when it comes to employment, when it comes to going to a, a sports event or buying a car or whatever, or, or in a regional hospital with specialized medical care, uh, that's a 45 minute city. So I think we're getting a lot better articulation and sensible policy. But it's, it's you know, if you carefully kind of knit your way through the empirical literature on this and things like economic performance and sustainability benefits, you, you find this, this is a really sensible direction to be going. Uh, but but I, um, I'm told I only have one minute, so I'm gonna have to really speed up here. But um, um, so, so anyway, uh, the, the short of it is, uh, if you, the numbers that drove a lot of these analysis, I insist a lot of them they go back to the seminal early foundational work of the article that Martin Wax and others wrote um, uh, 50 years ago, half centuries ago. Um, I, I have to be very brief if I could just have a few extra minutes here. And I have to say this last topic, again, uh, is using accessibility, in this case, to look at employment outcomes. And I present this with a certain degree of trepidation because I well know that UCLA is the home of Evie Blumenberg and Paul Ong, who've done a lot more definitive work than I have on this topic. So I, who am I to come up here and do this? But I, I, I did some research tying in the equity component here on spatial mismatch. Sp spatial mismatch, by the way, was a term first coined by John Kane of Harvard, where he tried to explain persistent chronic intergenerational poverty and high unemployment of inner city residents in Detroit as a function of the fact that a lot of the automotive manufacturers were moving out of Detroit and the suburbs. So there was a physical mismatch between the, where the jobs were and where the working class residents live, a lot of minority inner city residents. So it's been around for long. And I did a couple of projects trying to link uh, accessibility to this job performance, and particularly this welfare to work. So if I could just have a few minutes to go through this very carefully. This is one study, again, looking at job accessibility, and sorry, San Francisco Bay Area again, that's where I'm from, that's where I tended to have good access to data. Uh, but we looked from 19, it's a longitudinal study from uh, 1990, uh, I'm sorry, 1980 to 1990, and uh, it was based on occupational match. So again, this idea of this kind of socioeconomic qualifier, and what you find is during the 80s and this held into the 90s, the, the um, professional class communities of San Francisco job access was improving over time, whereas the lower income residents, blue collar, low skill workers of Oakland and East Bay and others, it was a negative shift over that time period in job access for the jobs that, and the skill sets in the areas that they qualified for. So again, that socioeconomic element. Um, and um, as part of this, we did some econometric kind of things, and I, I won't go through the details. If you know this kind of path model stuff, these represent standardized regression coefficients, or what are called beta weights, but they t show the relative explanatory predictive power of these variables. But this was the social equity component. We showed that the changes in um, black population were associated with negative 
changes in access to jobs in the skill areas that they qualified for, and that in turn was associated with the, a probability of not finding employment. So uh, if you're minority um, you, in your job category, job access was getting worse in the 80s, and th that increased the odds of, of not finding a job. Um, education mattered, but also not having a car. Uh, if you are minority and uh, the higher odds of not changes, it's delta changes over that decade of not having a car and then leading to um, no job. So that led to a round of research. So again, it was grounded in this core idea of access and this sort of socioeconomic um, qualifier that uh, Marty introduced me and others to. Um, that led to some work I did on what we called reverse commuting. The idea was that, well, if the jobs are suburbanizing and the inner city poor are concentrated in the center city, let's just run reverse commute buses and that'll solve the problem. And in, in fact, at the time, in the early 2000s, when we looked at, um, in California, these happen to be California metro areas, if you look at all of these strategies, most of them, except there, there were 20-something programs we looked at. Most of them were about changing the configuration of public transit services, extending schedules, longer weekends and later at night, new reverse commute bus routes, user-side assistance, uh, giving some subsidies to help cover the cost of transit, new shuttles to rail systems. But very few were low-interest loans to help people buy cars. And uh, this research, Again, my apologies somewhat uh, is uh, with, with sort of the quantitative nature of this, but we looked at the effects of over two ways between 1993 and 1995, whether at the time we had the public assistance program was assistance for families with the dependent children. If people went from a status of no job to having no job and still being on public assistance, that's the worst outcome, if you will. They still stayed on uh, public assistance. And the second wave where it's a group of people who got a job, but the earnings were so low that they had to still be in public assistance. And the best outcome was you got a job and you got off public assistance. And we ran all these models, including access, using, again, the socioeconomic kind of metric. I, I'm almost done. Um, and, uh, and, and the short of this analysis so is, yes, um, Poor access meant particularly um, higher odds of inner city poor not sh transitioning from public assistance to employment. But the more important finding I, was that having access to a car was far more important than uh, having expanded schedules of buses or new routes or feeder services or whatever. Car access is what mattered the most. In fact, if you looked at um, a place like Alameda County, which was one of the number of places we looked, controlling for everything else. If you found a household with a high school degree, 12 years of education, controlling for all the other variables in this analysis, if they had a car, there was a 67% higher probability of getting off public assistance and getting a job than if they had no car. So the conclusion of here, well, in many ways, I think like a lot of research of those of us who work in this area, we run the numbers, but you really only find out when you start talking to people and, and do qualitative research. And what we found out, and again, I got this from Marty, and mixed methods is critically important in how we do research, is that um, it's no great surprise that a lot of lower income, somewhat low to moderately skilled inner city residents need a job to reach the jobs they qualify for. They don't have high paying white collar professional class jobs in the center city, some but not a lot. Most of their jobs are scattered all over suburbia. They need a, a car for the same reason the rest of us do to get around suburbia. And it's magnified all the more by the fact that a lot of these individuals were working moms who had very complex travel patterns. They weren't making easy routes. They had to drop the child off at the child care center, then get to their job. They were taking vocational courses at night and had to get to this. When public transit was bad, they had split shift weekend jobs when transit services are notoriously lousy. So they need a car for the same reason. So this particular study really came on the side that uh, we need to rethink our policies 
and give access to uh, car, uh, uh, increase access to cars. So anyway, uh, in my very limited time, I, I wanted to give a thumbnail sketch of um, some research I did that I think has relevance to some contemporary policies, but how some of the early thinking and writing on accessibility shaped my own research, and I um, would submit others as well. I'm just going to end by this one slide. Um, of an article I wrote called Paradigm Shift from Automobility to Accessibility Planning. And I cite Marty's work as foundational to this piece. And it, you know, it's kind of an argument we hear all the time, but this was over 25 years ago, um, that, you know, again, we shouldn't be designing cities to move. You know, moving is secondary. It's not why we're hopping to cars, trains, or buses. It's the places and the destinations and the happiness and the economic productivity and the ability to worship and engage and interact with others, that's what matters, is the destinations, access to places we want to go, not the movement. So, you know, pretty straightforward idea. But probably um, the, the quote I'm most cited for came from this article, and it was this uh, quote here that planning automobile cities focuses on saving time and a swift efficiency of movement. Uh, planning accessible cities focused on time well spent. This happens to be a few bl blogs. Bringing in this idea of people, places, quality of life, uh, physical activity, social engagement and interaction and so forth. And, and I'll just say that that kind of early thinking where pl Marty again planted the seeds in his writing led to this book that I co-authored with um, Eric Guerra and Stefan All called Beyond Mobility, Planning Cities uh, for People and Places. And I cite Marty's work on chapter one called Urban Recalibration. Uh, we really need to rethink our planning uh, paradigms and shift more and more towards people and places and accessibility being the key driver. So, so anyway, um, I, I credit Marty with a lot of the research I had done in this area. It's, been tremendously impactful in terms of my own agenda, but I would uh, submit to say others as well. So this has been a bit of a tribute, a testimony, if you will, uh, to my mentor, Marty Wax, and uh, uh, I think the profound influence he's had on an entire generation of planners, our thinking, our, our research agendas, and, and practice. So with that, um, I will stop and uh, hand the floor over to Adam, so thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, um, Professor Severo. And uh, I'm Adam Millard Ball, and I'm planning at UCLA. And I had the privilege of um, asking a couple of questions myself before opening up the floor to, um, to, to all of you. And I wanted to, to start um, with a question about um, kind of your, your international experience. And um, I think you've been working in the Middle East, and your, some of your previous work has looked at transit planning in the, the Global South. And one of your classic books is the, the, the Transit Metropolis, right? And so if you were starting out again today, like, where would you go? Like, what would be the types of case studies you yeah. highlight in that? And would it even be called the Transit Metropolis now? Would it yeah. Be the 15-minute metropolis, perhaps? Yeah, maybe so. Um, yeah, you know, I, I mean, I, 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 I do wrestle with the fact that I, I've had the good fortune of having had a lot of exposure uh, to some of the challenges we have in all these areas in, in the Global South, m most of the rapidly developing world. And I, I've always been kind of puzzled that here in the U.S. we're toward a tweaking on the margins to get a little more efficiency out of electric mobility or ride sharing or whatever. But in the grand scheme of things, um, over the next 20, 30 years, 80 to 90 percent of urbanization is not going to happen in the Global North is going to be in South Asia and Africa and these very places. And whatever happens there is going to swamp any and everything we, uh, on a global sense of what we do here, particularly as it relates to carbon emissions and so forth. So I've just been naturally drawn to um, really how do we, at this early stage of urbanization, advance uh, sustainable cities and growth and, and with these equity accessibility themes and so forth. So, um, you know, when I started looking in, the, in doing work in Mexico and South America and in, in Indonesia and, and parts of Asia, 
uh, you know, you, you find it's a totally different landscape. Um, first of all, most of the poor are not in the core city. They're way out in the far-flung exurbs and suburbs. Um, so you're talking about lack of access. You know, we, we're talking about two to three hour one-way daily commutes. We're not talking about 50 minutes or what. what you know, just trem tremendous expenses in terms of time pollution. You know, the, the amount of time or resources you have to invest in your day, in a 24-hour day of getting to and fro just to earn, making earnings to, to cover basic needs are, is, is enormous. So, so what you find is that um, access is so many order of magnitudes worse in the developing world and our ability to sort of, um, through public policy strategies, remediate those problems are, are much more limited. So, um, you know, I'm sorry, this is not necessarily tied to the uh, transit metropolis issue, but uh, some of the research I've been doing is trying to show uh, cities around the world have been introducing these bus rapid transit systems. They can't afford to build these expensive electric rail systems, so we're getting these dedicated busways. And I'm talking about the Sao Paulo's and Jakarta's and Nairobi's of the world. Um, and, and the problem is that um, a lot of people in these far-flung outlying areas that are either can't afford the fares or it's going to be a lot cheaper still to take an informal, illegal microbus or minibus or so forth. So massive investment in this uh, BRT infrastructure, bus rapid transit, but they're under, a lot of them are underutilized, and you, you still have all the problems of overcompetition of the informal uh, paratransit sector. So um, I had been doing research on showing if you would try to integrate the private, quasi-illegal informal sectors into the public BRT systems, how it would affect access, save time, but also then how it would translate to employment effects. So um, I've had the good fortune of working, I, I haven't done a lot of empirical research since I've been retired on that, but I've had a number of students at Berkeley that have worked in this very area and I've helped advise and, and, and uh, so forth. So, so anyway, I think as it relates to accessibility and social equity, the themes of this talk, those are among the most important pressing things we deal with. As it relates to the transit metropolis um, idea, well, you know, I, again, I think it's more of a first world, you know, global north developed country context. In, in truth, uh, if you look at a lot of metro systems in China or um, uh, in parts of uh, Africa, you know, Africa doesn't really have rail, but let's say Latin America, it's pretty privileged class folks that happen to live and work by them. So it's not the same dynamics of, of access. Um, so yeah, I, I think the transit, you know, the transit metropolis model idea was that, uh, you know, very sensible idea. We should create places where people can easily walk to transit and hop in trains and buses instead of driving all over the place. You know, I think it, it is largely holds well in a developed country context. I think when you talk about the developing world, I, there, there's just not the capacity to do planning, to do necessary zoning, to enforce building codes, to really create great functional communities and places around. So I, I think the problems around stations, I think the problems are so much more fundamental and deeply rooted in that part of the world that uh, as it relates to transit, metropolis, and transit area development, it's, those are not the high agendas, low-hanging fruit kind of things we need to be focusing on. It really should be dealing with informality and some of the dilemmas that it faces um, and uh, how we better rationalize whatever investments we can afford. But, but I think it does ultimately come back to access, social equality, these core fundamental themes. It's just a different um, canvas that we're working on. Well, on the topic of, of access, and you, you can cast some doubt on the idea of a 15-minute city, but to what extent do you think this is an idea that's meant to be interpreted so literally? Yeah, and, I, and, and to what extent is this just another, like accessibility isn't going to excite anyone who's not like a, a policy one, right? Yeah, yeah, is this I, just I, a better I, way of framing I, I, I think issues? you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I probably have overdone it in how I, 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 I kind of more picked up, th there have been a lot of critics 
saying, let's don't do this, it's going to stifle economic performance and so forth. And, you know, I think it's been kind of a carte blanche, so let's just kind of ignore it. It's, it's a uh, inane kind of proposition. Well, I, I think there are, I think we all realize who doesn't want to, everyday activities, be able to reach in 5, 10, 15 minutes. Compelling, everyone can, kind of relates to that. So I, I, I think some critics have used it as a uh, smoke screen, so to speak, to carte blanche, just eliminate this principle. And in so doing, I think they kind of minimalizes or somewhat marginalizes this core notion of access. Because even though the 15-minute city has a lot more resonance than the accessible city, it is about access. I mean, that's fundamentally what we're talking about. Um, you know, access, Marty kind of mentioned this a number of times to me, was that, um, you know, access is one of these things that we in academics who kind of think at this high level can relate to. But if you talk about these theories of access or whatever, the average person on the street doesn't kind of grasp it. You know, this idea of occupational match and da da da. Uh, you know, that's, but, but I think if you talk about a 15 minute city, everybody can relate to that. The idea you want to be able to, by foot or bike or, or you know, micro mobility of all sorts, be able to reach everyday activities. And I think if anything else, I don't think the 15 minute city idea has really brought to fore enough of the benefits of promoting an active living lifestyle and, and potentially the social capital benefits of you know, people hopping in a car, leaving the driveway, and never interact, and they never take transit, and they never get a chance to interact with people of different walks of life and different ages and so forth. And now you put people in environments where there's more social engagement. I, I think that's a, a potentially high benefit from this that we don't hear a lot of discussions about. Right. Well, let me open it up to the floor, and um, who has a question? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you for, for this uh, very interesting, informative talk. So I was glad to see that Terrence uh, Gresko had a picture of Copenhagen in there. Uh, okay. But I wonder what would you say to a large transit agency like Metro who would say, well, we need more uh, lanes on the freeway because we don't have enough, and we need to have more cars driving on the freeway? Um, you know, if, if I really had a glib, uh, compelling response to that, I, you know, I could have retired ages ago. I mean, you know, it's, it's been the age-old problem. You know, I, I mean, I, I think it's just tied to the fact that politicians who make these tough choices and decisions that we plow money into freeways or public transit or bikeways or whatever, you know, they're accountable to constituents in these two to four to five year election cycles, so they think short-termism. And, uh, you know, all the stuff we talk about transit and great urbanism and transit development, the payoffs are 20, 25 years downstream in someone else's terms of office. So I think politically it never moves. So, um, so I, I, would, I would be really hard pressed to argue to someone where all their constituents are losing an hour a day stuck in traffic and they're miserable and you know, that you shouldn't be expanding freeways. You know, I, I, I hate to, uh, but you know, it's partly providing a legitimate, respectable alternative is creating more robust, better public transit with greater communities and access and micromobility around stops and all those things. Uh, but you know, it's it's also as Don Shoup and others have long said, pricing is is a big part of this agenda. There there is no gold, golden bullet solution. Certainly, um, you know, we often hear the induced demand argument. You know, there, there's critics saying um, when you build roads, it just fills up the congested levels within a year. And there's certainly a lot of evidence on that. It certainly holds to some degree, uh, but I, I don't think it's 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 really a concrete and pavement and supply side question as much as it is how do we manage resources and how do we price resources. So if you expand roads and then you continue bu business as usual, allow Home Depot and shopping malls to absorb that new newly added capacity by building nearby and you don't manage growth properly and, and you don't have respectable, legitimate alternatives like a, 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 a expanded, enhanced public transit system, and then I think you do get this induced demand effect. So, so it's, it, it's, it really is, I think, better urban management, better planning, better pricing, all of these things. No single silver bullet, it's, it's, a, it's a mix of strategies. Uh, but yeah, I, uh, I don't know, maybe Adam, you have a better, you're more of an urban economist than I. What do we deal with? Uh, 
the insistence on adding freeway capacity to, to deal with these issues. And, I'm going to save that my answer for another time because people are here to see you. I hate to to I'm you. the dead end. I don't want to make sure. I don't want to make sure. what an old retired sure guy does is pass the tough yeah. questions on to others. Yeah. So. And I want to make sure we have a question from a student um, as well. So, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, you were talking about the 15 minute city and the counter argument to that um, being that, you know, if there's clustering kind of promotes economic growth and if you do the 15 minute city, it kind of disperses that. But with the increasing virtual nature of work, the work life, yeah. um, how do you feel like that plays into clustering in an urban environment or the two-minute Yeah, well, and if you have a, like a 30-second answer, we can get one more question. Yeah, okay. Well, as well. I, I yeah. have an, a, a former academic. I, there's no such thing as a 30-second <laughs> answer, but but yeah, not, you know, not a 15-minute answer. Right? Yeah, I mean, you know. <laughs> It's the idea of agglomerations. How do you exchange knowledge and interact? So, you know, historically we think of physical proximity, you've got to be together, but obviously in a virtual world it can happen in many other kind of ways. So, you know, how do you innovate and discover and exchange knowledge? And, you know, we're such a world of highly specialized skill sets, we need all these external transactions with others. So, but, but it, you know, the, the notion of physical proximity, as we all know, has long driven this idea of agglomeration, but maybe it happens less. But, but you know, I, I say that somewhat um, it, with, with some hesitation in the sense that we've all seen what's happened with COVID where we've been forced uh, to use Zoom and other things, and I don't think any of us buy into the idea you get the same quality of exchange and interaction and personal learning and growth that you do in that medium versus physical contact. And you know, and it seems like we're all moving towards this hybrid model of kind of a, a combination of both. And maybe we can sort of pick and choose. But but you know, as it relates to the 15-minute city, yeah, you know, I, I guess it. If you only well, first of all, the argument is that it, it shouldn't really affect. Um, work trips because work shouldn't be part of the 15 minute model but you can also say in many ways it it uh retail you know with e-commerce and other things i mean i i walk around this campus i'm just amazed by all these little robots going all the way del <laughs> delivering food we didn't have that when i was here uh, but um uh yeah so you know technology is transformative so it's it's you know i think the whole idea of access and location and is being somewhat uh thrown around by, by all these rapidly unfolding, powerful, admittedly powerful uh, kind of uh, technological advances and so forth. So yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree with Adam, and I'm, it, it, I'm not first to say that. I mean, I, I think it was David Leverson that gave a talk here two years ago and talked about access the same night. I mean, he, he writes about that extensively in his blog. Let's don't take this too literally. It, it's really the core notion that you want to create you don't want to force design this environment where everything's within 15 minutes, you've got to live in the setting, but you create a lot more opportunities where people can sort themselves into these very kinds of places where they can walk and bike more. And um, to, to me, they you know. Yeah, I was going to say that's a great place to um, to leave it because sure. I believe they were out of, oh, yeah. out, out of time. Yeah, it's it's 7.15. I, for whatever reason, I thought it was 7.30, so I, my apologies, I'm <laughs> rambling on. No, but that, that's why you wanted to limit it to 20 minutes. <laughs> that's what we tend to do. Yeah. But anyway, but thank you so much yeah. for joining us this evening and um, linking both uh, uh, retrospective on both your work, but importantly how it works right. to uh, links well, to Mali Wax. So thank you so thank much. Thank you for the invitation.